and John Everson, who filled in quite nicely last week for our next guest, financial Phil McCoy. Phil, welcome back, sir. Thank you, guys. How is everybody doing? We're all swell. We're joined by the Admiral Bill Stubblefield and the New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap on the program today. And I should tell our audience that this program is we uh, replayed each weekday between 4 and 6 in the afternoon on the radio. TV, there's been replays going on for a long time, but we are now replaying the show on the radio, too. So, Phil, you are heard twice as much as you used to be heard. That's what I'm talking about. I hope no one holds it against me. If I had to listen in the morning and the evening, that could be bad news for me. You can't get away from Phil. He's all over you now. <laughs> Phil, how was uh, Orlando? It was good. It was good. It was a, a long week of volleyball and, and really early mornings. A couple of the mornings I could have actually caught in, and I thought, well, I might throw him off a little bit because I told him I told him that I was taking the week off from the show. But uh, it, it, everything went well. Everybody's back happy and healthy. They had a strong finish, so it, it was fun. There wasn't much uh, sightseeing. It was just full of volleyball and, and taking a break from that. This is your club team, right? It's my daughter's club team. I'm just uh, just dad. For, for this team so they were down at the national tournament which a lot of local teams went down and participated just depending upon their age group when they went but it's a huge event down there every every year there was 150 teams in ada's division in the in the team that ada plays for in their division and and there's like five different divisions with almost as many teams in each one so tons of teams in our huge facility and uh, they do a good job with it are there a lot of broken fingers in volleyball? No, no. You would think that there would be, but no, there, there's uh, there's not. I think the most common injury is probably ankles uh, that occur around the net, and then second from that would be shoulders and knees. But uh, but uh, you don't see too many finger injuries, and normally when you do, because of how they play, they just play right through that. They tape it up, or but not a lot of a lot of finger injuries. A lot of fingernails lost. Uh, you know, if they miss the ball or something and they have those the longer fingernails, you see some fingernails lost, but not a lot of broken fingers. How about broken hearts, Bill? Are there a lot of broken hearts? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every every team except for one ends up with a broken heart at some point. But, uh, you know, out of 150, there's so most of those girls, uh, I think they go in knowing that, you know, the likelihood of playing four consecutive days without uh, many slip-ups anyway, you're allowed one here or there. Uh, but you, to be on, it, it's almost more of a battle of attrition as who's the better team because you could have one bad match and you're done. You guys finished uh, ninth out of 150? Yep. And a few years ago, the same group, and of course there's new faces here and there, but a few years ago they finished second. So, But this year they, they came up a little bit short of, of that. But they, they played well. It was, it was a good tournament. Nine out of 150 is still pretty impressive. Did, yep, it's pretty good. Did Mickey Mouse get any time on court? No, Mickey Mouse did not. Last uh, the last time we were down there, which was when they were 15, they got to they got to take their picture with Mickey Mouse after the national championship match that they lost in three sets. But uh, but this year I, I, I did not see Mickey Mouse. Other than of course everywhere you look, there's the shape of Mickey Mouse, and our room where we stayed was full of Mickey and Minnie. It was just Airbnb that. Uh, that we had stayed in, but uh, I saw no Mickey Mouse at the courts. Oh, good experience. Nice. Uh, anybody else from the Eastern Panhandle on that team, Phil? Uh, yeah, on the same team, there's one player from Spring Mills, uh, Samantha Stevens, is on that team, but that's it. That's, uh, that's on that team. Now, there's others from the Eastern Panhandle there that, uh, of course, played down there. There's tons that played down there, but on this team, there's one from Musselman and one from Spring Mills. That's it. On to the market, Phil. Here's our first half of the year because this is day 183, 183 to go in the year, exact halfway point. To this point, the NASDAQ up 18%, the S&P plus 14%, the Dow plus 3%. What do you make of those numbers, Phil? Uh, it's technology. And when you look at just the makeup of each of those indices, uh, what's drug on the or, or or pushed, I should say, the S and P and the Nasdaq to to much higher returns than the Dow is just the percentage of um, technology stocks or companies that they have inside of it that, that lacks in the Dow. You know, for that matter, Nvidia, who is going, has been a, the talk of the stock market all year long, um, but it, it goes between the first, second, and third largest company in the world is not even on the Dow. So, and it has led uh, the S&P. It's been one-third of the S&P's 
uh, returns so far this year out of 500 companies. One, the NVIDIA, has been one-third of it, and then you throw all those mega caps in. And I, I couldn't name them exactly right now, but they've been two-thirds. So technology has drug us along. And as we kind of mentioned this morning, uh, one thing that I find r- really, really pleasing anyway if you would have given me the narrative, we've talked about rates and rate cuts and inflation and when the Federal Reserve may begin to cut rates and that being the catalyst, and it still is, it's still really, really important. But if you would have told me that we're sitting at the same place in July 1st as we were in December and the markets would be up like they had been, I would have thought, you're crazy. That's why we try not to predict what's going to happen in the markets. But uh, our, our markets have been pushed along by those technology companies. So hopefully, and I'm sure they have, that they've found their way into your portfolio. Even if you didn't do it directly, they're probably being held in uh, in, in exchange-traded funds or mutual funds, and you, you prospered because of it. So, But those companies have kept our markets afloat and done really well. You know, the S&P in particular and NASDAQ done really well so far the first half of the year. Now, Phil, you know the name Roaring Kitty. And it was reported on the CNBC.com site that Roaring Kitty took a 20% stake in Chewy, symbol C-H-W-Y, and uh, I should say a 6.6% stake in Chewy. Chewy stock went up 20%. I think it's still up 11% in uh, pre-market trading today. That's Keith Gill. He bought 9 million shares. He was the guy behind the GameStop run a couple years ago. Yeah, and it's, you know, there's a lot of debate upon, you know, what this guy's done, whether or not it's, it's moral or, or not, but I, I, I don't have a problem with it. Now, having said that, while I don't have a problem with it, I'm also not buying what he buys. I'm not going to hear that that uh, Roaring Kitty has purchased a certain stock or so much in a stock, and, and it caused me to take a second glance at it because we've seen those, you know, GameStop and, and I think AMC back in the day where they've had those huge pops and, and, and bursts of, of gains, and then they lose it all. And within a couple of weeks, as soon as he divest of it, but uh, I, I have no issue with with what he's done. He's manipulated in a legal way uh, the stock market, the same way that hedge funds do a lot of times. So, but but having said that, it's not as if Warren Buffett or or Kathy Wood or Jamie Dimon is coming out and, and making huge per- or Elon Musk is making huge purchases in something. And it's causing us to do the same thing or take a second look at something. And by no way do we do that. But uh, have to give the guy credit. He's made a lot of money over the years with his Reddit uh, following. We have a lot of reports that are out this week, Phil. And a lot of that uh, information is the kind of stuff that factors into how people read the economy and maybe even adjust rates. Uh, anything you'd like to bring to our attention for this week? June, just the, end of the June jobs report that comes out on Friday, and there's a few things that come through the week, but mainly the June jobs report that comes out on Friday. And what we're expecting to see is some slowdown from May. So just a, not a complete halt. We want to see a cooling labor market, not a cold labor market. And what is expected, I think, is we added 188,000 jobs or something to that effect. Uh, but but what that number, what we would like to see with that number is a cooling labor market, which would lead us uh, to believe that inflation would further cool down. And if that's the case, and what we've been talking about for so long is the Federal Reserve finally begin the rate-cutting process, that would be good for our overall markets and the bond market. Let's not forget the bond market. We don't talk enough about it. But it would also be good on the bond side of things. Remember, in a falling rate environment, existing bonds will do well uh, simply because they're more attractive due to the higher rates that they're paying. So th- that's an important part of our portfolios that we rarely, rarely talk about. So I've been trying of late to make it a topic of conversation, even though they are boring. You know, there's not a lot of speculation and so forth in bonds, but they do make up a significant portion of a lot of investors' portfolios. But we have to keep in mind also that our markets will, our stock market, our equity markets will do well on the perception that rates are going to come down, not when they actually come down, but the perception. That's something that we can we can kind of predict, or we'll we'll make assumptions of when that will happen. Look back at December when there was an assumption that there was going to be rate cuts in in March, and our markets did extremely well 
in December. Now, it turns out that they didn't uh, cut rates in March as expected because inflation didn't do what they had expected it to do, and that's where those NVIDIAs and the Microsofts and so forth kind of lifted us up and, and enabled us to have such a good first half of the year. Uh, but that is what we're looking forward to is if we can see a cooling labor market, not a cold one, a cooling labor market, that should boost our markets a little bit if that happens. Did you have a question, Bill? You're inching yeah, at your yeah, microphone. No, I, but I did not want to interrupt you and, you, you and Phil. You okay. go right ahead, sir. Uh, Phil, looking at the, some, some of the sectors, and, of course, you mentioned technology and communication did very well. Uh, but I was struck by the fact that energy did not do very well, nor did health care during the uh, first, uh, first half of the year. Yeah, not, not many things did do well. When you look at the major sectors within the S&P, not many of them did do well. Just the two that you had mentioned had done extremely well. Some of that is, is mixed in with falling oil prices from start to finish anyway. I mean, I know it goes up and down, but I think falling oil prices have uh, from, from January 1st until now and, and health care as well, which has got a lot of things tied into it. Now, health care uh, is, is a different beast when you look at and try to predict how that sector will perform. Um, you know, we'll, I'll, I'll take us back to COVID, which I do far too often, but back to COVID when everyone was buying Moderna and Pfizer and they thought that, that would, it was going to explode, and it really didn't. It, it, it boosted a little bit later, but not as it was going on. But uh, that those were the only two, and, it, and it's kind of just re re regurgitating what we had said earlier with the overall markets being top-heavy and with those technology that, and, and the communications that have pulled everything along with it. I, I wasn't really surprised at all simply because I look at it each, each and every day, but the, the technology, it, it is a very top-heavy market right now. What they're looking for is if rates do come down, a broadening of that, so some of the some of the other uh, sectors could do well uh, too. So we, we used to call that rotation uh, back in 2021. We'd say, hey, we're going to rotate out of out of uh, growth companies and into value, and that's another way of saying where the Nasdaq would slow down and the Dow would do better. And but we haven't seen that yet. That is, some, some experts think that will happen the second half of the year, assuming the economy continues to cool. What about financials? That's something. That's a sector we don't talk as much about. No, and and we and I don't think financials did all that well in the first half. I'd have to go back and check. They did not but in the first half of the year. I didn't think they. I didn't think that they would. But that would again be with what we're looking at with rates and slowing credit, and and their and their ability to to earn money simply because of credit slowing down. And but again. If rates begin to cut, what's that going to do but encourage us to go out and borrow more money? And that's when those financials could pick up. I actually heard that the stock for Ameriprise Financial was doing pretty well, Phil. Must be from all that good advice you folks are giving people. <laughs> well, Ameriprise does have a good name. It is the number one financial planning firm. I don't mean we have the most assets, but rated the, the financial planning firm in the country. So we're proud of that as always. There's, <clears throat> excuse me. There was kind of a uh, political tsunami yesterday, or yet, last week in the uh, in the debate. Did that have any ripple effect or immediate effect on the markets, from what you could see? Not yet, and and we like to say, and sometimes we kind of say it and, and wink, but the, the political realm doesn't really have that much impact on the overall markets. In the long run, in the short term, it certainly does. And, and I and I know, even though I was out of town, I watched a little bit of the debate. And what I can tell, and this isn't a political or, or me leaning one way or the other, but what I do know is that one of the candidates did not do very well at all, and there's a lot of fear of whether or not he's even a viable candidate anymore. But what it could do is sector-wise, you know, we just talked some about sectors, and, you know, you look at natural resources maybe versus green energy. I always use that as, as an example, but uh, natural resources like coal and oil and so forth – you would expect or you would think that if we're, if we're anticipating a change in leadership that maybe some of those sectors would do better in the long run opposed to a green company in the long run. But in the short term, I don't think it means anything at all. In the long term on our overall market, studies have shown it doesn't really matter who's in office, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, that the indices and the markets as a whole – 
there's really no change or no way to determine uh, which one would be better or worse for a market. This yeah. is a little different, though, John. Just yeah. real quick, just to drop in the fact that there is a stock that is based on the man who is run, one of the men who's running for president, which, which makes yeah. this, which makes debate performances a little different now than, it, than they used to be. About Trump's DJT. Yeah. How did it do? Did it jump? It immediately afterward it did took jump. a run, but then yeah. it came back down. As a matter of fact, uh, it closed Friday pretty low at thirty-two seventy-five a share. It's fifty-two week high, seventy-nine thirty-eight. It is up two point seven percent in pre-market trading. But it does make for an interesting thing to monitor as this campaign goes along is how does it affect the price of Donald Trump? Donald Trump well, my stock. question was based actually on a panic response, you know, because people uh, don't, aren't always rational in anything they do yeah. after they kind of get, oh, my goodness, that's not what I expected one way or the other. So I was just curious if, they, if there was an investment blip. Not that it's no, and, and last week because I have to admit I had to do some catching up. Like I said, we were we were we were uh, neck deep in volleyball and, and and chasing people around and trying to get to to a facility at a certain time and so forth. So my attention to the markets, although you know when I got an opportunity, I would look to see how everything was doing, was amazingly flat last week. I, and and I that even I, I kind of piqued my uh, attention some as well. It was amazingly. Kind of like it was up and down days, of course, but when you look at start to finish, and I would have thought the opposite, you know, knowing what I, I found out. And I didn't get to watch much of the debate because I was so so sleepy uh, from from watching volleyball, not playing, but watching. But uh, I watched a little bit of it. I turned, I tuned out when they started arguing about who was a better golfer. But the uh, that's kind of when I left it. But I would have thought that some sectors would have done better. Uh, based off of of the results of that debate, but and it m maybe after the Democratic convention to see if they if they name someone else if they actually replace him. But that's a, you know, that, that's far beyond what I do here is whether to to guess at whether or not that will happen. But maybe you will see at some point then some change in in some of these sectors, especially in the, on the energy front. You know, the different types of energy that may do well or poorly based off who we think is going to win. Now, yeah, you remember in 2016 when Trump won, the market tanked. That was amazing. Yeah. It was for amazing. About a, for about six hours. By the end of, yes. And, and it was scary. That was uh, I was scared, too, because I was setting up watching it. And I'll never forget that. And then by the end of the following day, I think our markets were green. Yes. And, uh, and it, it blew my mind. It absolutely blew my mind. And that is that knee-jerk reaction that, uh, that John had just talked about. And overnight trading, it was terrible, 6 7 8% to the negative but by the end of the next day it was positive i thought that was uh, that was amazing and a tutorial on how not to panic because what we think will happen most of the time doesn't come to fruition well let's carry that to the international market what if we thought we had a tsunami and uh with the debate last thursday we have even more of a tsunami in france and the impact that that election is going to have is going to impact the uh, uh the ukraine age of the ukraine is going to impact the european union it's going to be a, a broad impact i don't is a market re, uh reacting to uh the potential french election doll uh, not that I've noticed, not that not that I've seen, and, and again, you know, the international news. We say this far too, except for China, uh, on on the international front, and and we've seen it time and time again that typically any international news that would cause a jump or a fall in our markets is very short lived. It doesn't last long at all. Our, our American markets are very arrogant to what happens within our borders, as if it's the only ones that matter except for china and you know and i'll add on to a little bit on to those uh to the debate and in the perception that the odds that the republicans would win the presidential election has gone up significantly from what i have read anyway and, and from that standpoint on the international equity side that would also lead us to believe that there could be more tariffs at some point which would hurt the international markets, uh, if it has a huge, huge uh, holding in, in Chinese companies or companies from China inside of it, that would damage that because of the, the the perception that tariffs could go up. French markets are positive today, up over one and a half percent. In fact, all the major European indices are trading in positive territory as the day continues along across the pond. Uh, and their markets are led by right now the French. And the Italian markets, both of which are up in excess of 1%. Phil, 
Uh, we have debated all year long whether or not uh, there will be interest rate cuts and how, and how many. First it was how many, and now it's if any. And then we had a Fed governor speak up last week about potentially raising rates sometime before the year is over. It was just one of the governors. It wasn't the main person in charge, but it was just one. So I assume at least there's some sentiment out there. What are the odds of that happening? Very low, I think, with, with, the, with the direction anyway. As, as we said here in the moment, uh, the momentum is toward inflation falling. The momentum is toward a labor market cooling. And if that's the case, there is zero chance that they're going to increase rates. Uh, however, you know, they're they always saying, and I believe them, that they're data dependent. And if that data changes and inflation starts to come back up drastically, we saw, we saw it come back up a little bit in, in uh, April, and that's why our April was, was not a very good month. But if inflation starts to come back up or, or inflate at a higher pace, I should say anyway, because inflation's still here, but inflate at a higher pace, then that could be back on the table. And that was something that we had brought up a few times in, I think it was April. It could have been May. I don't know, my memory is short on that. But we had brought that up a few times with inflation starting to trickle back up. Would that cause them to start to say, hey, rate increases are back on the table? And I think that had been shut off by Jerome Powell in one of his speeches that, no, right now they are not discussing rate increases. And our market took a jump for that. But if inflation starts to come back up or rise at a higher rate and the labor market continue, it starts to tighten again and wages start to jump back up again, then we, we, that, if that were back on the table, that would be bad for the market. So we can see a repeat of the bad month that we had this year. And it was a bad month. And, the, and don't hold me to it, but I think it was April. I should remember that since it was only three months ago, but I think it was April that was the bad month. I assume by monitoring CD rates – what the mood is out there for interest rate hikes or cuts. And forever, the longer you tie up the money, the better the rate that they gave you. But as of Completely the last year or now. so, the longer you tie up the money, the worse the rate they give you. Yep, and that's because they're anticipating rates coming down. So if you looked at a five-year CD and you know no institution wants to pay you 5 or 6% when they think rates are going to come down within the next six months or a year and continue – to fall down and then they'll be stuck in paying you that but they're willing to pay you that for three or six months but not for uh, a longer term because they are anticipating rates will be coming down sooner rather than later and we've seen this you know even even the rates you can get on a three six nine twelve month uh, risk-free rate of return whether it's a cd or some type of certificate or whatever it's backed by but we have seen those uh, fall slowly fall just because of the anticipation that rates will come down sooner rather than later. So if you look right now, I think the best rates you can get are probably around a six-month uh, risk-free rate of return, and that's going to get cut by almost a full percent in some cases if you go out to a year because they think rates are coming down. So Capital One, their sweet spot is 12 months. They're still doing 5% at 12 months. And then at 18, you can get uh, something in the fours, and then the longer you go out, the more it drops uh, into the threes. Uh, but I, I I also read that theirs is one of the higher ones in the market, at least anyway. Phil, i got about a minute left. Tell everybody how they can get in touch with you today. You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue uh, right here in Martinsburg, except for Thursday. We're closed on Thursday. You are back on Friday, though. Yes, we are back on Friday. Yeah, we are not here on Thursday. We're not here on Friday. And by the way, Phil, as we've turned the calendar into July, you know what happens in July, don't you? That football season is, is near us. It's coming up. <laughs> That's right. It's the, Highway to seven. <laughs> it's the start of NFL training camps, baby. Yeah. Can't wait. Yeah, man. Phil, have a great day. Thank you, guys. Welcome home, Phil. Thank you, sir.